Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, if you're in Japan or Korea or far away Russia. Uh, thank you so much for choosing to join this event. I know we are, there are so many events happening all the time. Thank you for joining us also at this earlier hour of the day. Today, this session of our event is entitled The Emerging Power of Women's uh, diplomacy toward lasting peace, sharing global experiences to support reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a few instructions, which you will also see on the screen. Um, you can choose your language by clicking on the globe. As you can see there, it says interpretation. Probably easiest is if from the beginning you choose either English, Russian, or French, and then you will not have to change as we go. And uh, if you have questions also, please, uh, you can click on the button for questions, uh, Q&A, and that also upload your questions, which can be dealt with, some of which will be dealt with uh, during the program. So thank you. My name is Carolyn Hanshin, and I am the coordinator of the International Association of First Ladies for Peace for Europe and the Middle East. The convener of this session with the Women's Federation, uh, the convener of this session with also uh, a partner, the Women's Federation for World Peace. I will just make a few introductory remarks, introdu introduce words from our first speaker, uh, senior vice president, and then I will introduce our moderator. There have been over 100 virtual events organized by the Universal Peace Federation and partners linked to the future of the Korean Peninsula since November. I have listened to quite a few of those discussions on very innovative themes with direct or indirect connection to Korea. But what ran through each of these events was the outpouring of humanity toward the situation of the Korean people, a people who are actually very removed from our daily lives. Through the presentations, they became people with a face and a personality, not just a stereotype, which is so important for peacemaking. Surely this outpouring of concern globally is and will continue to reach the ears, the hearts of the people of Korea. While we have to talk to the political leaders, of course, about this, and we are, we, but we cannot just wait. We also have to mobilize our all spheres and create a groundswell of support that will reach the key decision makers, giving them no alternative but to take bolder steps. We have heard that even yesterday, that lines of communication between North and South have been reestablished. Our very eminent guest speakers who are with us today will contribute to this discussion about the transformative power of women's diplomacy in strengthening institutions, in building community, and strengthening families. Their advocacy and example publicly and at home as first lady, minister, parliamentarian, activist, entrepreneur, are models that we can all learn from. Each has a unique success story, and each is willing to offer their insights, life experience, and tireless strivings towards the cause of justice, reconciliation, and peace. Before I introduce you to our moderator for the panel discussion, I will introduce to you our first speaker who will be presenting through a video recording, as she is in Hawaii at this time. Uh, but I think maybe she has joined us. Maybe she is anyway able to listen in. Her name is Dr. Sunjin Moon. She is Senior Vice President of the Women's Federation for World Peace International. Dr. Moon is the daughter of our founders, Reverend of the founders of the Universal Peace Federation and the Women's Federation, Reverend and Mrs. Sunyun Moon. Uh, she has volunteered and held various positions with Family Federation, Universal Peace Federation and currently with the Women's Federation since the year 2000. She has been the chairman of the Pacific Rim Education Foundation in Hawaii. 
She is uh, working in the area of psychology now. She has a bachelor's from Harvard University, currently enrolled in Columbia University's master's program in clinical psychology. Uh, she is the founder of Giving for Good, a project that the Women's Federation for World Peace is working with her to develop and has recently raised over $250,000 for environmental and humanitarian projects. She also happens to be a yoga instructor. So please uh, enjoy with me the video of Dr. Sanjin Moon. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and a privilege to participate in today's program on the emerging power of women's diplomacy towards sustainable peace, sharing global experiences to support reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. I wanna thank our leadership of the Universal Peace Federation in Europe and the Middle East, Dr. Katsumi Otsuka and Mr. Jacques Marion for organizing this series of international leadership conferences that bring together experts from around the world to collaborate in search for peace on the Korean Peninsula. I also wanna thank the wonderful leaders and members of WFWP here in Europe. You never fail to uplift and inspire me with your great work. I would also like to offer a congratulatory applause to Ms. Carolyn Hanshin on her elected victory as president of the UN NGO CSW Geneva and her lifetime of amazing work as leader and president of WFWP Europe. In this ILC series, all the primary associations of UPF across all sectors of society, government, religion and academia, and the media, business and the arts are engaged in offering their wisdom and insight in this effort to open a path to peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula in Asia and the world. This particular session of the ILC is convened by the International Association of First Ladies for Peace, which works together with current and former heads of state of UPS International Summit Council for Peace. I would like to thank Her Excellency, Aneli Chatin Maki, our moderator, who was president, present at the inauguration and an astounding role model for women and peace. WFWP is working in partnership with UPF to advance the work of IAFLP, drawing on the wisdom, insight, experience of First Ladies. I am deeply honored to welcome our speaker, Her Excellency Madame Neila Mouad, First Lady of Lebanon, whose life and legacy continues her late husband's work and their tireless passion for peace. As Minister of Social Development and as a Member of Parliament, she has led with a true mother's heart that gives everything for the sake of family, country, and the world. I also welcome all the other women leaders on this panel and all the ones who tirelessly work behind the scenes. We salute you for your great works for peace. Her Excellency Madame Nezia Labidi, I look forward to learning more about your great work as a diplomat, politician, activist, and your extensive experience in service and leadership in NGO life. Madame Khaloud Kasim, your sincere heart and passion to engage women in leadership roles is very exemplary and inspiring. Thank you for your attendance and your valuable contributions today. Today, together, we have achieved great strides forward in realizing this dream of peace. As women united, our work can make an enormous contribution to the greater work for peace and human development around the world and for all life on Earth and for the security and future of our planet. Our topic today is extremely important for it underscores the importance of the role of non-governmental actors or non-state actors in the search for peace. While the role and significance of governments are undeniable, these track one approaches to peace may be and need to be supplemented by track two approaches that involve people to people interaction. In this latter effort, 
the role of NGOs, FBOs, premonitory organizations, social entrepreneurs, and of course women are absolutely essential. That is why our meeting today is of such great importance. Since the time of the Korean War, 70 plus years ago, the peninsula has been locked in conflict and division. In many respects, the Korean peninsula, or more accurately, the Korean people themselves are victims of a wider geopolitical context. Initially, this was manifested in the wider global conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War. While there was hope for peace at the end of the Cold War, we seem to have drifted into a new Cold War, this time between the two major superpowers of the 21st century, China and USA. In other words, the Korean conflict in many ways is embedded in a larger global geopolitical context. As long as the superpowers are locked in competition, it is not easy to open a path to peace. All the more reason for us to explore the potential of non-state actors and women in particular. When I think of Korea and of women, I cannot help but think of my beloved mother, Dr. Hak Cha Han Moon. She was born in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And as a very young girl, as the Korean War conflict was arising, she and her mother fled to the South as refugees. She was driven by a profound spiritual vision, and she knew it could not be fulfilled in a land that had no religious freedom and human rights for its citizens. She, together with my father, Reverend Dr. Sung Myung Moon, have worked their entire lives to promote peace on the Korean Peninsula. Recently, my mother asked UPF and WFWP to give full attention to the situation on the Korean Peninsula. As leaders and champions of the Track 2 diplomacy, my parents went to DPRK in 1991, 30 years ago. They met with then Chairman Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of DPRK's current ruler, Kim Jong-un. At that same time, my parents shared with Chairman Kim the need for reconciliation and called for DPRK to open up culturally, economically, and politically. Following that meeting, they took immediate action and initiated a variety of peace efforts, opening up an automobile company in Pyongyang and a hotel. They began developing tourism so that people of South Korea could visit and meet their long divided family members in the North and build bonds of heart, common ancestry, and mutual trust between the peoples of the two Koreas. They organized cultural exchange for example, like sending the little angels to the north to perform. In addition, WFWP has worked directly to send humanitarian relief packages to the people of DPRK. Later this year, my amazing mother hopes to convene a world summit, bringing together leaders and experts from around the world, including hopefully a delegation from DPRK to meet and dialogue together. My mother is totally committed to this goal of global peace, and she has and will offer her entire life and resources to bring about peace, to reconcile this heartbreaking divide of her homeland of Korea. That is her deepest hope. It is not merely for the sake of Korea and the Korean people, for the peninsula represents a tipping point for peace and reconciliation for the world. She sincerely and deeply believes that if we can succeed in solving the division of the Korean Peninsula, we can solve the divisions that exist throughout the world. Her vision is to work collectively as one global family to mend all the devastations of war, conflict, disparity, and to resolve all the problems that contribute to this catastrophic state of our planet as we all know, the climate crisis and COVID-19 cripples the globe. This is why we are all gathered here in this virtual forum to collaborate, contribute, and carry out this dream of securing lasting peace, mutual prosperity, and universal values for all life on this glorious earth. I am so inspired to observe the work of so many courageous, visionary, 
powerful women leaders, along with great organizations like WFWP and UPF, taking steps for true peace across the world. In closing, I want to once again express my deep appreciation to all those who have worked hard to organize this program today. Your work, our work, is so very important. May we vow to realize this vision of lasting legacy for peace for all life and the earth for generations to come. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share a few words with you today. I am confident that our work will be pivotal for this collective dream of peace. Thank you for your investment in this great and noble cause. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sun Jim. We are so proud of you as our leader for the Women's Federation for World Peace, working together with our president, uh, Dr. Julia Moon, and uh, the whole of Women's Federation actually working towards developing this, this uh, new association of UPF, the International uh, Federation of uh, First Ladies for Peace. International Association, sorry, of First Ladies for Peace. So now it is my great honor to introduce to you our very eminent moderator, who, as Dr. Moon said, was with us at the inauguration of the First Ladies Association in, um, in Korea. Uh, she has contributed to ideas of development for this new network of women leaders and which happens actually to be holding events. This association, International Association of First Ladies for Peace, is holding events all over the world in all regions in these upcoming few days. So this is one of many. Um, she should have actually been at another important activity, but Mrs. Yatenmaki, sensing our need for her for this event, actually canceled the other and offered to help us as moderator for this session. Her Excellency, Mrs. Anelia Yatinmaki, was the first female prime minister of Finland. She is a lawyer, has worked as a lawyer of her party's parliamentary group until she was elected to parliament herself. She served as minister for Ju of justice for two years. Mrs. Yatinmaki became chairwoman of the center party of Finland and served in the European Parliament from 2004 to 2019. Again, thank you so much, Mrs. Yatenmaki. The floor is yours. Uh, you are muted. Good. Now? Yes, good. Good you're here. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Caroline, and good morning or good evening to everyone. I hope that we have a very good discussion today. And I must say that it's a great pleasure for me uh, to discuss with all of you today. Our topic, it's very challenging. And uh, as we know, women are not so often seen and heard in the context, in this context of diplomacy, even, even if it is uh, utmost important that we women are active and have a role in defining and shaping peace and reconciliation, and also on the Korean Peninsula, all over the world. To get peace in the world, it requires that both women and men we include in the process. It's a difficult pro process and it doesn't happen in one day, in one month, or even in one year. So we must have time to work and during that time we can also learn from, from the process. But now I will give the floor to Mrs. Mowat, and uh, I want to tell you that uh, Mrs. Mowat is a board member of the National Commission for Lebanese Women. And I want to tell you that I have had the possibility to visit Lebanon some years ago. Very beautiful country. 
And uh, Mrs. Mouad is also a founding member of the Democratic Forum and founder and president of the Rene Mouad Foundation. And actually, she became very, very active, or she started her political career after the assassination of her husband, the late President René Mouad. And now we have the honor to listen what this excellent woman has to say to us. The floor is yours, Mrs. Mouad. Thank you so much. And I'm really very pleased to join again this very important meetings and this uh, very important group of first ladies. And it's so important now all over the world because uh, this meeting is highlighting uh, the, the, uh, the role of women and, uh, uh, and in, uh, this role is essential for a peace building and very important role in promoting not only peace but harmony. And as we can see many examples in the very uh, these times and even before, that men alone cannot uh, cannot bring a culture of peace since their own ambitions. These uh, since their own uh, uh, they want to control everything, and it has led to a conflict and war within the nations. Uh, and within and among many nations, especially in Lebanon, where we are going through these days, uh, we are going through a very hard, uh, mo very hard moment where unfortunately corruption is too important and, uh, and uh, we, can, uh, we can only see and we can eyewitness a great upheaval in the political arena. And I think it's really time for women leaders to join forces and to pave the way for a culture of peace and prosperity for all citizens of that nations, as, as well at the, at for Lebanon and as well globally. And of course, very specially for, a divided, for divided nations like, for instance, North and South Korea uh, will bring as, as, uh, the citizens great advantage socially and economically, because nothing is worse than having personal ambitions and not looking at our citizens. And really, men, women can do a lot about it. Yes, I have been a first lady, but for quite a short time. And my husband was assassinated only 17 days after having been elected president of the Lebanese Republic. And uh, I thought my duty was to continue his work because he wanted a free Lebanon, a prosperous Lebanon, and uh, uh, implementing a very good uh, education and, uh, uh, and universities for our children and implementing the, the symbol of working together so that when people are not harassed by conflicts, they can become, become very, very productive. And uh, I think it's time for women leadership to join forces, as I said, and to be, uh, to be ready for a culture and peace, or of peace and prosperity for all the citizens around the world. And during the 17 days when I had the responsibility of being first lady, I went and paid visits in very poor areas in Lebanon, some of the border, uh, at the borders of Syria and others at the border of Israel and some of the borders of other boards, and uh, 
uh, I brought them something very important in looking after your people. It's empathy, and this is essential. And seeing a first lady not only well dressed and uh, being uh, at her husband's side, but also seeing a first lady where we, we could talk very frankly and they complained about their problems and they complained about their situation. And I had promised at that time that I would do my best. Well, of course, after my husband's assassination, I went through hard times. But the first thing I started was a very important, a very important NGO for uh, 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 under the name of my late husband, uh, husband, and this NGO is working all through Lebanon without any 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 uh, 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 any differences amongst the people, with uh, amongst any religion, amongst any uh, any uh, any problems, any problem all through Lebanon because people thought when I started my electoral campaign and during four years, I was the only woman in the Lebanese, in the Lebanese, uh, uh, the Lebanese parliament, they all thought that I would do everything to only please and help our people in my own uh, area, which I didn't do at all because my late husband, Rene Mawad, was president for the whole Lebanon, and he want to institutionalize uh, uh, the Lebanese people to make them aware of their privileges and to create more privileges for them. Because once you are happy, once you have your, uh, your uh, basic rights being implemented, you can make a group of women leaders and it's very essential so that we can work all together and create a better Lebanon, a clean Lebanon at the physical sense of the, of the term without any garbage on the, on the seats as we are having now, and a clean Lebanon without corruption, uh, only devoted to create good, good, uh, uh, good days for the people in different areas and to be all over Lebanon. I can tell you that now we have about 10 uh, offices in many areas in Lebanon and we are being very much helped by uh, institutions like USAID and uh, institu Lebanese institutions. We are being very highly helped also by our Lebanese people who left Lebanon and uh, are being quite successful in many areas in the whole world. And now that they, they can trust the uh, foundation, they are sending lots of money, uh, especially after we had a dramatic problem with, uh, with the destruction of the Beirut port and it has uh, killed more than 217 people and it became many more because many of them were badly wounded and they died after 15 days or 30 days or 20 days. And to create a new uh, mentality uh, where we have to be all together to support the needs of the whole country and people who need badly to be helped because they are either poor or they cannot help their children, having too many children, especially in certain religions where you can uh, get married to more than one woman. And uh, I think it's time for women leaders to join, to join forces and uh, pave the way for a culture of peace and prosperity for all citizens of their nations as well as globally, especially for a divided nation like, uh, 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 like North and South Korea, 
And I think Korea, which was a very healthy and very rich country, with now all this, these uh, conflicts are uh, uh, impoverishing the Korean people. So I think that uh, uh, reunification would bring for the citizens great advantages socially and economically, which is essential today for any citizens of any country. So uh, I'm very happy to tell you more about Lebanon, to tell you more about our mentality, our mentality of women in Lebanon, where we've been helping uh, through the René Mouad Foundation and through the fact that we always try to, to cooperate together, we have been helping the poor Lebanese people because I'm sorry to say that even for now, for some years, we have no more of our, the, the middle class people are getting poorer and poorer. And uh, many Lebanese left Lebanon. Many Lebanese people cannot now send their children to school, whereas, uh, whereas uh, the Lebanese people were known all through the Arab world as being highly cultured, highly I'm sorry, but we suffer in Lebanon out of uh, uh, lack of electricity. So uh, I'm sure that uh, Her Excellency uh, must have been cut, and, you know, her electricity must have been, you know, there's, she doesn't have electricity probably. That's why it was cut off, I think. I'm sorry. Our situation is really difficult. I, I, yeah, I think we can continue. Uh, this is okay. Yes. Okay. I want to thank Mrs. Moved. Uh, we can all see and now understand that the situation in Lebanon is really very, very hard. And uh, if we can get the connection, I would like to ask Madam Mohamed some questions. But now I think it's time to, to continue and give the floor to the next speaker because uh, Madame Mowell can't listen to us. And our next speaker will be from Tunis. And uh, she is uh, Mrs. Lapidi. And she was Minister for Women, Family, Children, and senior citizens in Tunisia uh, many, many years. And um, now she is vice president of the think tank Institute for Prospective uh, and Advanced Strategic and Security Studies. And uh, she is uh, president of the Women, Peace and Security Commission of the African Women Leaders Network. And that uh, is uh, that network is working with uh, with the African Union Commission and also with the United Nations. But now the floor is yours, Mrs. Lapidi. You are very welcome to to join us, and we are waiting for your words. The floor is yours. Bonjour. Good morning. Aslama de la Tunisie. Hello, Aslama de la Tunisie. Uh, uh, my heartfelt thanks go to the Universal Peace Federation 
I congratulate you for the organization of these very high level conferences. I'm also very sensitive to the presence of eminent international personalities who raise awareness and address a strong and clear message. A watchword is that the voices of women are the only way to have lasting peace for all. Um, I think of Spinoza, who says that uh, peace is not the absence of war, it's a virtue and a will uh, of uh, uh, justice and uh, goodwill. So when women participate in negotiations for peace, uh, there is 35 more chances uh, for a good result. And when they are in a negotiation, there's more peace. There are very few women that negotiate uh, in uh, peace processes and security. Uh, according to, uh, so as you know, Tunisia is a country that has the right of women in, uh, uh, 850 before Christ, uh, Queen Dido founded Carthage with the oldest constitution, according to Socrates. It's again a woman, the Muslim princess Arua, in uh, 735 uh, of our era, who abolished polygamy. Today, we're at the threshold of the celebration of the National Day of Women on August 13. It's in 1956 that the late Habib Bougiba, founder of the modern Tunisia, promulgated the code of the personal status, which abolished the polygamy, instituted judicial divorce, and reorganized the family relations. This code underwent numerous amendments. In 1992, it was a great turn. It was the Article 23, which stipulated obedience to the husband. It was replaced by mutual respect and gave mothers the right of guardianship. So since then, uh, the women have new rights, and since then, one amendment follows another, such as the granting of nationality of the Tunisian mothers to her children and the abrogation of the circular number 73 that allows the Tunisian women to marry non-Muslim men without them having to convert to Islam. The women's... Uh, Minister for Women and Family, which I was in charge, is a very key minister uh, for social and educational. And uh, diplomacy in Tunisia for women is starting uh, from 2016 by organizing some events in the with the purpose to integrate gender equality and cooperation. In July 2017, there was a law against uh, uh, violence against women and that was uh, accepted unanimously. And it's a new protection for women. So when So the age for sexual consentment went from 13 to 16 years, thanks to a certain feminine diplomacy. It was a work that I accomplished with the civil society and we won in 2017 was also uh, the addition of uh, Tunisia against uh, violence, sexual violence. And that was the first country that was able to participate in the Council of Europe from this side of the world. And we had our first national plan as the resolution number 1325. And uh, we had also eight following resolutions. There are also um, 
there's an observatory of a fight against violence and uh, uh, the automization of women and the uh, creation of the Council for Equality of Chances between men and women. But even though we have so many efforts, it's a long way to have new behavior and a new opening to respect human dignity. If I can speak about myself today, I'm speaking about myself and us and others around the world. I'm the daughter of a military. Uh, it was a child uh, that had to uh, go through so many traumas that he could never heal. In France, in the 70s, 80s, I met uh, many great women who fought for women liberation, like Simone Weil, and they had determination and resilience. And with them, I visited refugee camps in Lebanon, in Syria. Uh, but the worst experience I had, and it's still staying in my heart, it's the image of blood of 5,000 children who were killed. And that is real horror of the war. I am a universalist, and I think it's more important for humanity to recognize that each culture and civilization has the right to have values without prejudice and uh, not to influence them and to have a common uh, values and universal values and human rights. And it's the same. Uh, um, uh, to say that uh, well, human relativism places the needs of human beings beyond all creeds and beliefs and without discrimination. When you, we come from different horizons, but we share a same desire that we leader, women leader have to bring to the world uh, security, stability, and uh, well-being. Uh, women's diplomacy is just at its starting point. It came from Sweden, from this uh, uh, Swedish uh, uh, person whom I greet, uh, with whom we organized a forum on the gender in Tunis in 2018 in other countries like Canada and France and also think tank uh, US followed that. And the world context uh, is supporting uh, uh, so we can reach the uh, uh, goals, ODDs in 2030 and also the African goals of 2063. Now we have this pandemic uh, and the rise of hostilities, which uh, leave serious after effects at all levels, threats of food insecurity, climate change, and threats of wars also between South and North Korea divided into antipodes because of divergent political systems, also military uh, interests and, and nuclear weapons to have a lasting stability and reconciliation. Mandela said in order to make peace, we have to make, uh, to work with the enemy so that this enemy becomes our associate. For the two Koreas, there's a long history, an ethnic history that makes out of Korea one nation, one ethnic group, one. Uh, of the Han people that is, has lasted for over 4,000 history. Many attempts have been made for reunification of the two uh, countries as the Sunshine Policy and a new attempt in 2018 
that supported the sports diplomacy at the Olympic Games with two uh, uh, joint uh, teams and other diplomacy, such as registering the popular game, Korean wrestling in the intangible heritage of UNESCO and even the diplomacy of cheerleaders smile that helps to reunify the two Koreas. I'd like to say that uh, impossible is not Korean and the reconciliation between the two Koreas will take place. I'm sure that our efforts uh, that should be continuous uh, uh, that uh, is helped by the women's uh, diplomacy will help to reconcile the two Koreas and UPF uh, with uh, a culture of heart and respect of diversity of uh, diverse history, social practices. Uh, we have to have that from little childhood to really overcome every relativism in order to respect universal women's rights. And my thought is for the two Syrian brothers, athletes who met again after so many years of separation at the Olympic Games in Tokyo in 21, the same thought goes to all the families separated on both sides of the line between the two Koreas. I'm watching with great interest the resolution of uh, the conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia, the country that is run by a woman with ancestral uh, uh, wisdom. We can remember a queen and with the same thought that go to the children, to the way comfort women who militate every Wednesday for her uh, uh, many years to, to uh, reconquest their dignity that was lost, that had been lost for uh, many years. My uh, thought also goes to the women, women hazarded hostages of the Daesh, and in Palestine and elsewhere to the homeless children who wander with the, without identity, without memories, without roots, and probably without wings to fly. And with the same voice, I'm calling on the universal conscience of women and when for a world based on love, respect, and acceptance of others. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you have full success in your work. And today I have this uh, necklace that was given to me by a foundation of fight against in the two Koreas. I hope you have a lot of prosperity in the world. Thanks, Mrs. Lapidi. And you have a very nice, beautiful and also important necklace. You must be very proud of having it. But uh, we will continue, but I will give you one question so you have time to think what to say. I want to tell that uh, you are a very good example of women. And that's why I would like to ask, what was the reason you became activist? You are working for human rights, helping also for helping women. And what gave you that strength to become activist? And also what could we do to activate more women in our own organizations? But you have now, you have now time to think that that what to say because now I will give floor to our next speaker who will be Mrs. Kolud Kassen and she is also from Lebanon and 
Kolud Kassem is the founder and president of the non-governmental organization Lebanese Women Towards Decision Making as well as well of the social non-governmental organization Mothers from Lebanon. And uh, you have also published two books on politics and uh, you were visiting European Union Parliament and speaking, speaking there. I was listening to you because then I was a member of the Parliament. And um, today you are a member of the Vital Voices cohort since 2019. But now the floor is yours. You are welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really, it's, it's a privilege and honor to be on this platform. I would like to first thank uh, Ms. Caroline Hanson and, and, and Nikki Tuma for uh, inviting me to be a speaker on this prestigious platform of amazing women leaders to talk about the subject, which I consider is my mission in this world. It's women in power and it's peace building. I would like to also commend uh, uh, the Women Federation for World Peace and the UPF for their endless effort to make the world a better place for humanity. And, uh, um, you know, I, as Dr. Uh, Sanjim Imun put it, uh, thank you for your service. I believe that every energy that exists in this universe has a job. Zillions of energies perform their mission naturally or instinctively. Only humans are blessed with the power of the mind to act with intention and perform accordingly. The key is the awareness about the responsibilities that we carry to execute before we leave this life. Strange how many of us think that we came just for the satisfaction of our physical and material needs. Some people do learn the hard way, and still some, many others, they don't really learn from their experiences. Life for me is a beautiful, exciting journey that I learn to enjoy with all its happy and not so happy moments. I'm blessed with the power of love, love to every single thing around me. This power has strengthened my ability to understand human behavior that is usually the result of past experiences. Few people are usually capable of understanding others' mean behavior, for usually people react impulsively in an aggressive way to others' violent actions. I'm not trying to say that we have to act like saints and turn the other cheek, yet when we find people with such values, values, we have to hold on to them, for they are the true peace builders, and the world is very much in need of such energy. I come from a very conservative and close community where I was denied the freedom to fulfill my dreams because I am a girl. I fought my way to the university and I succeeded. I fought my way to leave the house just to go to work and I succeeded. I even had to fight my way to drive my own car and still I succeeded. These primitive rights that I've succeeded to attain, where they come natural for other women in the world, have empowered my ability and boosted my confidence to reach out for the sky. They taught me truly, really, sometimes it's a cliche, but I really believe in it, that the word impossible, I saw it as I am possible. The key factors here are, uh, is the patience that God has given me. I, mean, I am a patient person, and I wait for the right moment, the right timing, and then I go and do it. In 1994, I was uh, an elementary homeroom teacher where my word was restricted to school life and caring for my children. Due to my feeling of injustice, I decided to change my life while keeping my family. My father once told me, never fear anyone. For everyone, no matter whether he's a king, he's a president, you know, you keep the respect, but there are humans like you and me. You can be anything you want. I then went for, um, 
Uh, keeping that in mind, I went to the most powerful figure in Lebanon to support my future dreams. I then went from being a nobody in the Lebanese society to somebody who got the interest of all the local and regional media. And I think uh, Ms. Caroline, she knows that story. It's a long story. I wouldn't want to take from that uh, from the webinar. In 2013, I followed my dreams and decided to bring change to the situation of women in my country and the region. So I decided to run for the parliament. And then I was faced with all kinds of family anger and threats on top of community cynicism. My first challenge was to get the support of my own small nuclear family, my husband and my children. This initiative, which I've taken, really shocked my husband, who really also comes from a very conservative family. I mean, we don't come from a political family, and I wanted to bring that change to my community. So at the beginning, he was furious, and he tried to stop me in all his powers. However, with patience and love, I managed to get him to become my main supporter. We, as women, and especially in our part of the world, have to prove that we can we we can step into we cannot step into the political arena, into our uh, that is you know it's really a patriarchal society, and we have to face all the obstacles. Uh, we cannot. They consider us that we cannot uh, uh, you know face all of these obstacles. Whereas men, they just go there and do it. Women as decision makers is not the norm in my country. Still, we were among the few first countries to give women the rights to vote in 1952, you know, in the region and in some of the world. My first trial to become a parliament, uh, it was in, 19, in 2013 where the elections didn't take place. Yet women started to lobby to encourage other women to run for office. We started as a very small group uh, of women. And in 2018 election, we were 113 women. You know, this is unprecedented. It never happened. We were 113 candidates. We who dared to, to challenge the status quo, we ch challenged, you know, this political arena that is, um, that is restricted to these political people who, who were responsible for the world of Lebanon. They are the ones in control of the country at this, at this point. In 2018, so as I mentioned, that we were 113 women candidates, and this was unprecedented moment, but it was the first time in the history of Lebanon where we had that number of women who dared to challenge the politically corrupted arena, and we said, yes, yes, we can. Yes, we have the right. Yes, we will bring change to our country. We women are the catalyst that will bring peace and security to our country, and without our energy, without our presence as decision makers on the decision-making platform, Lebanon will not rise again. After the 219 revolution, our women now became the far front liners of facing corrupt politicians. I believe that we should not wait for peace to come to us. I believe that we have to go there and grab it and we create our own peace. And only women can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Kassam. Very interesting story. And I will also ask you some questions, but before uh, you can answer first before the others so that you have time to think or to say. And this is very personal question. I hope it's not too personal. But I think that many ladies have the same problem than you have had, that your husband was not so enthusiastic at the beginning. And uh, what changed the mind of your husband? So we can use the same method than you, if you can give us some tips. But now I would like to ask if we have got uh, connection to Mrs. Mowad, because I have a question also to her, but I don't know if it's possible to, to discuss with her anymore. I would like to mention the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we have a massive, massive uh, uh, 
cut off electricity in the country. So I am here, in, I'm not in my office, neither at my home. I came here to a cafe where I had to, you know, get the Wi-Fi to make sure it, I'm not being cut off. So I am here in a cafe where they're unbothering other young men <laughs> who are <laughs> speaking here. So the situation is really uh, devastating in the country. Uh, but I mean, we are fighters and we will make it happen. You know, we will change the situation. Okay, but it's actually, if we can see something good from that, is that now we who are taking part of this discussion, we can see really what the disc situation is. But may, may I, maybe I, because we have now the connection to you, could you answer my question and then we go back to Mrs. Lapidi and she can answer the question I gave her. But please, the floor is yours again, Mrs. Kassam. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to repeat the question, I'm sorry. I didn't... Yes, it was that, that uh, like many other women's husbands, they are not so enthusiastic at the beginning the, when the women become active. So that what make your husband to change your, uh, to change his mind and could you give some tips for sure. many, many millions of women to, yeah. to, to, to do the same than you, that the husband is positive and, and, uh, and let the female yes. to be female and also active. Thank Please. you. Let me tell you something, really. The first key, I believe, is, as I mentioned, is the power of love. When you don't make your, uh, your, um, or your bad experiences that you go through, or probably sometimes you go through injustice, and you get this prejudice and you act out of hatred, you will not be able to function normally. When you try to understand you know, but you have to have, I mean, I think I'm blessed with this power that God has put in me that I accept, I accept not to surrender. I accept with the intention to change, you know? So uh, um, my husband, at the beginning when I married him, he put me in a, in a house for five years and he used to lock me in in the house. He never let me out of the house at the beginning because he was very jealous, even though he is, he's a doctor, you know, he's a physician, he's very highly educated, but he's a very jealous person and he doesn't trust probably the community and he doesn't trust anybody. Um, it took me a lot of time to make him trust me, uh, trust my abilities, trust my decisions, and I had to accept my situation because I had my children, you know, I have children. I wouldn't want to jeopardize their safety and security and, you know, their sanity. They needed the, the mother and father figure, and this is what I believe. He, he's a good man, but he's a very jealous man. So I thought that, you know, with patience, I can change him. So my first step was to go and teach, become a teacher, where I was a certified teacher. I graduated from the American University in uh, sociology and uh, anthropology, and then I took my teaching diploma. So I was a qualified teacher. So I went and taught. My second step is that I felt that I have a lot of energy and a lot of power, and I like to serve. You know, I care about my country and I want to give more, and I feel that I have this great love in me that I can give. So, my, my strategy was a little bit uh, naughty in the sense that um, I had his friends learn about my accomplishments. Yeah? Whenever I accomplish and do something, I would never go and tell him. I would tell his close friends in an indirect way. And then they would come to him and they would say, wow, what did your wife do? I mean, this is amazing. And then he would feel that no, this is the right decision, whatever she's doing, you know, it's the good probably thing. So when I introduced the fact that I want to become a parliamentarian, you know, I want to go and serve and I can help the people, he felt that I am capable. At the beginning, as I mentioned, he felt, I mean, this is scary in Lebanon. 
if you don't belong to the political arena, it's really scary because these, the authority is restricted to these people. But then when he believed in me and he believes in the way I act and function, he started supporting me. It takes time, patience and love. And these are the key keywords. Okay, thanks. Time, patience and love. And now, if we can get connection to Mrs. Lapidi, she could answer how can we activate more women and what got her to, to become active. But thank you, Mrs. Uh, Kasem, and all the best for you and also for your country. But, because by the way, you have I a very, very... Also, uh, by the way, I'm just also uh, running for the 2022 elections parliament you know, uh, despite everything that's happening in the country. All the best, all Thank the you. best for you. Mm. And now I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Lapidi, if we can get the connection. For this uh, Thank you. I think that there is a movement, an international movement nowadays, a will, an international will that is also universal to allow women uh, to be in uh, positions where decisions are being made. They are not only in government, but they also have to be at the level of civil society because mm -hmm. civil society needs to play an important role and uh, we, uh, women leaders, we need to bring as many as women, young women, and also young men as possible. So young men and women to uh, uh, take more uh, um, responsibility in the civil society, but also in politics, because we see that youth doesn't think of politics and don't trust uh, politicians and uh, political decisions. So it's our duty to create uh, uh, this uh, flow that uh, young people can be in the political life engaged and also on the uh, country level, but also on the local area in their town. And then so that they can expand to the national and international level. And uh, uh, we have a national plan for uh, uh, a child for children from zero to six years old to integrate this idea of becoming a, a global citizen. Uh, to think that this world belongs to us, also the country, there's more, there's need for us to uh, uh, invest more into having a, a discourse that we can uh, give young people uh, the opportunity to speak and listen to them and have them speak, have them express their thoughts because the world belongs to them, the world of tomorrow. And to have this kind of solidarity be, uh, among generations, between generations, we can start thinking together and live together. And on the other hand, the world doesn't need to be cloistered and uh, uh, with all these obstacles of language, religion, culture, all this has to be overcome. And nowadays we need to, uh, to work together, to work for solidarity. Yesterday I heard a young person who told me in 2050, there will be a great famine and we won't have anything to eat, not just African countries, but everywhere in the whole world. And the cars will stop because there won't be any more energy or very little. 
so we won't be able to go by car or by plane. He gave a picture, a very negative picture for the youth, for the future. So it's our responsibility to reflect on uh, what will happen after COVID-19 and why there's such a climate change. Uh, the floods uh, that Belgium and, and Germany had, and also in my country this year, we have uh, uh, only 50% water in our dams. So the next conflicts will start around energy and water and other things that will really hurt future generations. I hope I could answer you. Thanks. Thanks. It was excellent answer so that we got very many good tips. Thanks for all the speakers. And now we have the question time, not too much time to questions, but uh, Mrs. Marcia de Abru has promised to, to, to take over now. And she has been the chairperson for, for many uh, organization for women's federation for world peace in spain and many others so that now i would like to give the floor to marcia de apro and thanks all the speakers and also for for the first speaker mrs uh, Mowat, who we couldn't get any more contact but thanks for everyone and now the floor is marcia de apro Thank you, Mrs. Jatanake. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, dear panelists. Uh, I have gathered a few questions, uh, maybe one for each of the panelists, enough time. And I will address you according to the order in which you have spoken. So my first question was to uh, Madame Mawad, but as she is not here, I'll go to uh, Mad uh, Madame Mrs. Labidi. And the question is the following by Aisilio Garaeva. Women position in North Korea, uh, women position in the Republic of Korea is quite unstable and complicated. Despite government attempts to improve the situation, inequality remains strong. Uh, the Republic of Korea ranks last in terms of the women position in society. So how do you think it is possible to improve this situation in 10 years, for example? And what should the government do in your opinion? The screen is yours, Mrs. Labidi. Okay. I told you before that uh, I'm optimistic. I will speak of the situation in Tunisia. We had a great improvement uh, until 2020. And uh, the elections in 2019, uh, the women in parliament uh, there were 35% and now only 23%. So there are fewer women now, it decreased. So we can hope to have again uh, an increase and a betterment in the situation. And first of all, the civil society has a great and important role to play. And I believe in South Korea, there are, there is probably a better situation than in North Korea, but uh, the women uh, have to be obedient and uh, respectful of the values and uh, cannot uh, have abortion and there are many problems. And all this means that civil society has to play its role. When I 
speak of it, it's the international civil society, like uh, uh, the UN, uh, the universal women diplomacy have to play a role to uh, to make uh, women in both countries aware that uh, human rights for men and women must be equal. And uh, the culture uh, is what gives us roles. And these uh, international organizations have to play an important role and the regional organizations as well. We have uh, international processes that show that every country, just like North and South Korea, that uh, entered uh, the 1325 uh, convention, that they have to prepare their national action plan in which um, there has to be uh, equality of chances between men and women and that they have to be careful about that. I know in Tunisia in 2014, we uh, talked about gender and there was a huge resistance uh, from the side of Islamists who said that this gender talks about all the deviancies like accepting homosexuality and so on. So I think that we need to have the mentality evolve and that it's possible. And uh, let's say in 10 years, we can, as universalists, really uh, make an action plan, not just for the two Koreas, but for all the countries that resist uh, the change and don't accept that human rights are for both men and women and uh, that can accept uh, new values with respect. Uh, without having to uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, the country's situation directly. But if people don't agree with us, at least we can start a win-win uh, situation with uh, civil society so that both careers can reach a point where in which women in both careers can have a maximum rights. I've seen there's only one woman speaker on the Korean TV, which I think is not normal. Thank you, Mrs. Labidi, for such an insightful and balanced response. Thank you. Thank you very much. My next question will go to Mrs. Kassin, and uh, it says, your presentation pretty much explains a can-do mindset. What concrete advice would you give to the North Korean women now? What I would say is that, uh, Women, they have to lobby with each other, to support each other. This is very important. Women must support other women because there's no one who would defend women's rights and women's causes except for women inside the parliament. It's only women. Not because men, they are careless about women's rights, no. But they have more other probably business uh, uh, related issues to deal in the parliament with all due respect to all men, you know. So uh, women has to stick to each other. They have to be patient. They have to lobby with each other and they have to be, um, you know, they should never see that there is a brick wall in front of them. There is always a light, always a light. Look for the light togetherness and then 
I'm sure you can reach whatever you want. You can bring any change that you want with, uh, with working together and heading towards the light. Thank you, such a wise response. Thank you, Kolud. Um, uh, as uh, Mrs. Mawad wasn't able to, to come back, uh, she asked Carolyn Hansching to convey a short message on her be behalf. So uh, would you like to go on, Carolyn, now? Um, thank you, Marsha. I would love to do that. Is it posted somewhere? Actually, Mrs. Moavat asked me to convey her message. I think so. I thought so. Uh, this is oh. Hermine Schellen, who is Women's Federation President in Lebanon. Uh, please, Hermine. Yes, okay. uh, Mrs. Moavat, I spoke to her after this uh, incident. She said that it was never happening to her before. They don't have electricity problems. They have two generators but suddenly the internet disconnected and they don't know why it disconnected and they could not reconnect. So she's very sorry for this incident. She apologizes. And also she wanted to say a message. She said that she was very happy to participate in this meeting and she really hopes we can continue have this kind of meetings, have more interaction together and work together to promote the culture of peace. That is what she likes to uh, say, you know. She wants me to communicate this message. Thank you. Thank you, Hermine. Thank you, Mrs. Madame Mouad. And uh, to wrap up this question and answer session, I will uh, address the two speakers with a general question. And it is with such a small number of female diplomats, how much influence do you think there can be on politics in particular to contribute to the unification of the Korean Peninsula? Diplomats, how could they contribute? It's not the number of women that is most important, but it's the will. Yeah, the number is important as well but it's uh, the will to, uh, to change and uh, to work for, uh, for this uh, reunification of Korea, because I see that the two Koreas, they are uh, really 180 degrees opposed on the economic uh, level but and ideological, but they have a common cultural past that is very old. And I believe that uh, women leaders, it doesn't matter if they are diplomats or or if they are in peace missions or if they are in NGOs. They will uh, uh, carry a program and we cannot do anything without a vision and a strategy. <clears throat> if uh, inside ourselves we have a vision and uh, uh, the will to reunify the two Koreas, this reunification is possible. And also to have a strategy with uh, um, concrete uh, and measurable objectives. Uh, that's the way to reconcile because they have common points. And if they have common points, that's where we have to work and uh, diminish the points that are opposed because the reconciliation of the two Koreas is not uh, favorable just for the two Koreas, it's for the whole world because we know there is a danger, not just for the two countries, but an international danger. So, uh, these uh, women today can constitute a small team to expand and to have uh, an influence with uh, to reconcile uh, these two brothers 
all these two sisters uh, that were enemies so they can become sisters that love each other and work together. We've seen that in many countries like in Germany, in Rwanda, they reconciled and they went together also in South Africa. So this reconciliation is important. Thank you, Mrs. Labidi, excellent response. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask Kolud the same question. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was uh, reading uh, a report by uh, Sidao yesterday, and it says uh, uh, that there are only 22 countries out of 119 that never had uh, uh, a woman leader in their countries. Yeah, like 119 countries, they don't have women leaders. And they say with this rate, this means that uh, it will take 120 years probably to have a gender equality in decision making across the world. You know, I believe in the effort of women and every, you know, Your Excellency, Mrs. Naziha, I would say that every woman who's capable of being, a, a, you know, in a, in a decision making position and she gets all of these obstacles is a wasted energy. You know, countries can benefit a lot from the, the efforts of women because they are the peace builders. They are the ones that look at life. They would never jeopardize the, 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 the safety of their children, their citizens, you know. So whenever we waste all of these energies, uh, it's, it's, it's a waste for the country. So uh, I believe that, yes, we have to multiply and triplify our efforts as women to lobby together to support uh, uh, the peace building in the Korean Peninsula and across the world as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Kassian. I know both of you are speaking from, based on, the, uh, on your own personal experience in life. So it's not just words, but uh, it's being carried with heart. Uh, thank you for this precious input to this session. We have finished with this uh, question and answers uh, and answers part. And I uh, give it back to you, Mrs. Jatamaki. Uh, I, I think, Marcia, that maybe Mrs. Yatanmaki is was expecting that we we close the session. She had. Um, I I see. So, would you like to do that, Carolyn? Okay, I can do that. Yes, uh, just on behalf of the IAFLP and the Universal Peace Federation, uh, just thank you deeply to our speakers today. Not only their prepared presentations, but actually the spontaneous answers, which were so profound and so encouraging. I think we have, uh, it, it, it's quite incredible, even without direct experience in the Koreas, we are able to really relate as women and even feel that we can give some advice or some, uh, you know, some thoughts for their future. And I just wanted to maybe mention one project that the Women's Federation one uh, for World Peace, which is a co-sponsor today, that we have a project that we're, we're actually lobbying to the governments of North and South Korea. We have a project uh, proposal for a meeting place for women in the demilitarized zone or near to the demilitarized zone, a peace garden, a place where women from North and South could meet together and begin working together in some kind of zone of security and support and even the political decision makers are slow. We feel we could really, based upon all that has been said today, that we could really uh, accelerate this process, showing that it is possible to, to work together. We think alike, we have the same dreams and goals. And thank you so much to everyone for all of your, your contributions today, Madam Yatanmaki. Thank you so much for, for really helping us to make this a really important event and wishing you all a good uh, future in all of your work and all of your efforts. I'm sure we are all activists for peace. So our next, um, Marcia, did you want to introduce the next, the next event?
Well, the next session is led by IA, uh, the International Association for Economic De uh, Development, uh, about the potential of private sector initiatives to boost the North Korean economy. We have um, um, important speakers, and it will take place at two in the afternoon. Uh, uh, European time, CET. Yeah, thank you. And maybe could the speaker stay on that we could take one screenshot with all, also some of our organizers. So thank you again, everyone. It's really been a remarkable, profound, thought-provoking experience. Thank you. Thank you. So for those who can, you're uh, invited to watch a video, a short to three minute video clip of the inaugural uh, ceremony of the uh, International Association of First Ladies for Peace in Seoul, Korea in 2020. Thank you again to everyone. Thank you. One year after its creation, the first General Assembly of the ISPC took place at the 2020 World Summit and had for theme the realization of an ideal world of peace centered on coexistent mutual prosperity and universal values. It brought together nearly 7,000 high-ranking personalities from 171 countries, including 120 former and current heads of state and government. The former Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, delivered the welcoming address. Several heads of state and government then highlighted the vision of the ISPC through speeches. I'd like to thank and extend my special gratitude to Dr. Hak Ja Han for hosting this summit and commend her long standing commitment to peace and reconciliation. Por eso me permito felicitar a los fundadores de la UPF porque están haciendo lo que otros solo hablan. The Mother of Peace encouraged participants to place God at the center of everything and called for the realization of peace in the world. In addition, first ladies from several countries came together with the same heart and determination as their husbands. Thanks to the ISCP, in December 2019, the Republic of Palau successfully organized the Asia-Pacific First Ladies Summit, which brought together 80 women leaders, including 20 first ladies. These ladies launched the International Association of First Ladies for Peace in order to solve with a mother's heart the fundamental problems of the world and thus spread the women's peace movement. We must look into ourselves, draw upon that value, and work together as women traditionally would to create solutions to, ch to challenge the threat and that our families are facing in our homes and our nations. Let's take this uh, opportunity to build strong relationship and partnership for our future and for the future of our children. The Mother of Peace is determined to achieve a world of harmony and peace with a motherly love. Yes. Accompanied by the Association of First Ladies, they will broaden the horizon of a world of peace through close collaboration with the ISCP.